Okay, we're going to look at a game this morning with a very different history than any other game I have in my collection. Now, the game was conceived by Andrew Rowland, a resident of Australia. And Andrew began this project over 27 years ago. And it was conceived from the ground up as a grand strategic Napoleonic game utilizing miniatures. Now, Andrew painstakingly painted up hundreds of miniatures for the eight countries involved in the game, including uh, those countries that had fleets. So it was a major undertaking, and uh, I can see why it took years to complete. Now I'm trying something new in this video. I'm trying to integrate audio sep uh, recorded on a different track along with slides, so this video may not be as successful as I wish. Anyway, in this picture you can see uh, an early version of the game with friends playing. Later on, Andrew designed and created custom furniture for the game. And as you can see from the finished product, it's absolutely incredible indeed. Phenomenal work, and I've seen nothing like it. Uh, congratulations, Andrew. I think this project of yours is just incredible. Now, in more recent years, Andrew got the idea of releasing the game as a standard board war game. In this photo here, you can see some uh, original artwork for the board version. Uh, it was, the counters were a bit more simple than in the final version. Compass is the publisher, and Compass tried to make as close as possible uh, Andrew's vision. Here we have a, uh, an aerial view of the finished product. The game is huge. It's actually two maps with many, many, many pieces. And in the next pictures, you're going to see uh, the box as I sorted it and put it away. The box is full of goodies and you'll be hard pressed to get all the pieces in there but they will fit so without further ado let's go to the video portion of the program okay i'm just going to do a long shot here in my ikea table to show you how much room this game actually takes now the next shot will have the table with the fly leaf up okay so this will give you an idea of how much room the game actually takes. Now I'll set up the map and then you'll get an idea and we'll look at the pieces. Okay I've centered the map here on the table. We've got a bad glare. I'll correct that when I change angles. Again just to show you how much room the map takes. Now by the time we get all the playing aids on you'll see the game is uh, game table is rather full. Okay here's a section of the map as you can see uh, well it's just a beautiful map area movement and on the edges of the board you're going to see where you place your cards you've got a little wee tray area where you'll place your counters uh, for each side eight countries in the game uh, it can be played two player of course with two players each player is going to be taking multiple countries and you've got this victory point track around the edge here it goes all around the board and we'll get over into the east there. Apologies for the glare. Let's look at the pieces uh, close up. You'll get an idea of what this game is like. Okay, here we have the eight distinct nationality cards. Each nationality has 20 cards. So you've got 160 nationality cards. And we'll take a look at them uh, closer in a minute. Over to the right here. We have, uh, I'm not sure what we'll call these. Um, they're more mnemonic devices to record what events you've uh, accomplished to get points. So these cards are all the same. The defense cards show you get 10 battle points. Capture a commander, 10 battle points. Destroy the enemy's spy, 20 points. Capture their capital, 30 points. And if you get a sea victory, 10 points. So there's a heck of a lot of cards in this game and they're all very well done. 
So the rule book points out that there's 240 cards in this game. So there's a lot of history. Let's take a look at uh, one country's particular deck. Okay, well, we won't go through all the deck, but here's a few examples of uh, the Russian deck. Treaty of Bucharest, Broken Continental System, which all has various game effects, Hoodwinked. I see that the cards are color-coded in some manner. I don't know yet what that means. Probably means a type of event, I guess. Prussian War Horse. War and Peace. Ooh, mentioning Leo Tolstoy's novel. Very good. Mikhail Kutuzov. Let's take a look at another country's cards. Let's take a look at uh, some of the British. Well, there's a hoodwinked card. So I guess there's matching events. Yeah, Continental System. Disaster. Battle of Karuna. As you can see, they're profusely illustrated. Wonderful borders. The text is crystal clear. And large, oh, my favorite, War of 1812. Thank you, Andrew, for including that. Um, they're just great cards. And to know that there's 160 of them, that just tickles me pink. Okay, this game has a lot of counters. Now, the rule book says that there's uh, six sheets uh, with 130. So we're talking, what, at least 780 counters. Now, I'm not going to show you them all, but each... Nationality, hat, of course, has its own distinct color. And uh, we'll take a look at some typical British counters to give you an idea what they're all about. Now, these counters are huge. I love them. They're actually three quarters of an inch across, and they're quite, quite thick. Compass has done a very good job on giving good quality counters here. Yeah, the ruler shows the uh, counters are three quarters of an inch, so very good for these old eyes. Now the numbers, uh, upper left, well, the A is attack value, D is defense value, M is the movement factor, and in the bottom right on some counters, of course, you've got the little flag showing you the nationality. For the um, ships, the L means, uh, well, laden, which I suppose is their carrying capacity. Now you might have noticed when I showed the introductory video, the original counters only had one number on it. And I must confess, I do prefer those. I think having the multiple numbers on it makes the counters a little busy. But I don't think Andrew had the final decision in that. But uh, irregardless, this is a fine game, and the counters and components by Compass are terrific. Each nationality has its own distinct card with various information on it. Here's the British one showing you the order of play, the turn phases, the military costs to purchase units, movement, tax strength, and defense strength. And on the back, you get a little miniature of the, of the map. Now each car, card contains the same information. So there you've got the Russians, Prussians, Austrians, Spanish, French, Ottoman, and the Nordic nations. You get this long mat here where you can place the defense, capital, victory, spy, and captured commander cards, and of course return track below. Now, one thing I will say about this game too, that um, it's one of the very few Napoleonic games to cover the entire Wars of the French Revolution, beginning in 1798 to 1815 Waterloo. Many Napoleonic games only begin in 1801. Of course, that's when Napoleon became emperor. But uh, I'm very glad Andrew has included these three extra years. Of course, in 1798, um, Napoleon would have been, what, maybe a, a corporal or a lieutenant or an unknown captain. So... Um, he made his career at the Siege of Toulon, of course. That's where he steps onto the world stage. But uh, this game does start early, earlier in 1801, which is a refreshing change from other Napoleonic games. Now, when you're playing only two players, you get these handy rules in brief card, which gives you the Napoleonic, uh, uh, the, the French alliance versus the uh, 
uh, what Andrew's calling the British Coalition Alliance. And there's a mine of information on these cards on both sides. So when you do play two players, you're going to have the British, Nordic, Prussian, and Russian against the Austrian, Spanish, Ottoman, and French. Now I can hear a couple of you howling already saying, wait a minute, Austria, didn't she change sides? Well, of course she did. This period is very, very complex to um, portray, especially 1798 to 1815. Alliances and uh, events were changing all the time. And no single Napoleonic game has been able to uh, you know, not abstract some aspects of the conflict. Now, it's inevitable, I suppose, that some people will be wondering, um, how does this game compare to other games, like, let's say, uh, Napoleonic Wars by Mark McLaughlin, done by GMT. This currently is my favorite Napoleonic game, but it's long out of print, and it's not perfect, but I do like it a lot. More recently, they've reprinted Mark McLaughlin's War and Peace game, in a huge, huge game, and um, it's a good game too, but this game is stronger for scenarios rather than a campaign game. The campaign game is weak in that game. I think this game is still a very good one, The Napoleonic Wars by Mark McLaughlin. So, unfortunately, I can't comment on the play of Andrew's game. It looks fantastic, and I can't wait to play it. But that's not going to happen anytime soon. Certainly not in this world of COVID-19. I'm never going to be able to get eight players together to play this thing. And I might even be the only fellow in Ottawa that even owns the game. So until we get a Vassal module, I don't think it's likely I'll be able to play a multiplayer game of this game anytime soon. Now, apologies in advance if this video is not all that you wanted it to be. I would have loved to have shown you more, but I'm just not familiar enough with the game, and I don't want to give it a bad rap just because I've goofed up playing it. Uh, I'm anxious to play it. I sure hope I get a chance to play it soon. All I can say is uh, Compass has done a nice job with the components. Compass always does. They always have great components. Uh, like I said, thick counters, large counters, beautiful graphics. Um, just not much more else I can say about this game, except it just it's a tremendous amount of work. You saw in the introduction its origins as a miniatures game. So uh, congratulations, Andrew. Well done. And I hope the game does well. Thank you for watching.